If you know anything at all about UFO lore, you know something about Men in Black, the shadowy government agents who urge, cajole, and even menace people into keeping quiet about their UFO experience. And some of that lore goes even farther, infusing the figures with qualities and abilities that suggest maybe they aren't even human. While I really enjoy reading that stuff, those versions of The Man in Black weren't going to work for D versus M. I had decided that for all the fantastical elements I was going to put in the series, the human characters were never going to be one of them. That meant I needed to create a plausible Man in Black. I had to find a more grounded, real-world take on the profession, something people would buy as a real person who exists, and avoid the popular ideas about them as either shadow government nightmare phantasms, or on the other end of the spectrum. Let me see you just bounce with me, just bounce with me, just bounce with me, come on. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit about the Men in Black in D vs. M. We're going to talk about the first Man in Black you ever meet in D vs. M. And thus far, the only character that has made an appearance in more than one episode. Ruben Garcia. So as I said, my primary objective with writing the Men in Black characters was how to make them plausibly real world. Simply put, if there are Men in Black out there, if they really exist, and we had to bet real money, our own money, on what they were like, where's the even money? What's probably the most realistic, safest, most plausible take on a real world Man in Black? That immediately rules out them being the cartoon boogeymen from the conspiracy literature. It rules out them being supernatural in some way. It rules out them having access to bizarre alien technology. It rules out them being creepy sociopaths. I mean, these are people you actually have to interview and hire, and they need to show up to work. They can't be crazy robotic serial killers. In the real world, it would be a job. A government job done by a person who goes to work and does their thing and has some of their paycheck withheld for a pension and goes home each day. Would it be an unusual job? Sure. Would it require them to keep a lot of secrets? Yes. But that is not very different from a ton of real jobs that a ton of real people do every day, whether it's working at a nuclear missile site or doing research on advanced weapons, or being a spy, or even being an undercover cop. Like, there are lots and lots of real-world examples that you could look at to try and sketch some sort of composite of what an actual man in black would be like. So those were my references. I wanted to capture that vibe that no matter how extraordinary the job, it's routine for somebody. And the people who do these jobs, however amazing we might find it from the outside when they're within it they're doing it and they also have barbecues and go to movies and read the newspaper and get constipated <laughs> it's... even that barest outline of what a man in black would be already felt like the right track because i don't see it anywhere else in fiction we always see these extreme versions Again, either like weird boogeyman or something kind of comical like uh, the Will Smith movies. We've never, at least that I've seen, seen a very straight take on the man in black. The closest I can think of is maybe X-Files with Mulder and Scully. I mean, you could sort of think of them as men in black. That's not what they are, but that's about as close as we ever got that I've seen. Maybe you guys have seen a show or seen a movie or something that's more gritty or authentic feeling, I would love to hear it. Put it in the comments. Not only did I feel like it was unexplored creative territory, I kind of felt uniquely qualified to explore it. 
because I come from a family of government employees and civil servants. I have people in my family who are war veterans. I have people in my family who are police officers. I have people in my family who had top secret clearances. I myself am a government employee. And in my day-to-day -day job, I meet all sorts of other government employees. So it's not a heavy lift for me creatively to try and envision what would a real world man in black probably sort of be like. Actually, it was for me pretty easy to picture. And honestly, it was easier for me to imagine what a man in black would be like than to imagine what it'd be like to be Jenny Burke. I mean, that's just from my background. So not only did I feel like I was the person to write that sort of character, not only did I feel like it was a sort of character that's not written much, and not only did I feel like it was the right kind of character for the story I want to tell in D versus M, it just seemed like for the very first installment of D versus M, the ideal way to introduce the readers to the world of D versus M quickly. That's the heavy lift of your first issue in a series or your first movie in a series or your first show in a series or whatever. You have to establish for the reader in as natural a way as possible the tone, the feel, and the rules of this world you've created. You need them to quickly pick up. Is this comedy or a drama? Is this sci-fi or fantasy? Is this scary or, you know, you, and, and give them a sense of what the parameters are. What's possible in this world? What isn't possible? Basically, what can you expect? Even if you're surprising the reader, you want to give them a sense of like the zone that surprises can happen, if that makes sense. My favorite way to introduce an audience to a world quickly and efficiently is basically to just make them a fly on the wall. If you're smart about picking the time and the place that you're placing them, they should get up to speed in a very natural, organic way. The key is just picking the right spot. With D versus M, once I decided, well, the first story is probably going to involve men in black, I fell in love with this idea of like, what if you were have in a ride along with a man in black? What if you were just in the car and listening to them talk? What would that sound like? And that seemed like the perfect way just to start this whole series. So some writers would have these guys talking about all the obvious things, alien autopsies and spaceships and Roswell, and I didn't do any of that. I really took my time getting into Man in Black's specific conversation. Because again, with D versus M, I'm chasing authenticity. I don't like exposition, especially conspicuous exposition. But even more so, it just it doesn't sound true to my ear, and that is the big thing I'm looking for with D versus M with the human characters. I want them to seem very real world. Two men in black wouldn't be talking about those things in a car. For the same reason, two guys at Subway aren't sitting there passing the time talking about roast beef. Like, that's not, that's not normal. That's not natural. I have to find a way to organically steer the conversation toward that. And then when they do talk about their job, it needs to be in a way that sounds authentic and plausible to how people who do that job would probably talk about it. There's no stopping to explain things to a non-man in black. There's no stating things for the record that normally you would never have to say to someone who has your job. I'm trusting the reader to get up to speed organically through osmosis. It's no different than if you sat down with a table full of strangers at a bar or something that are in mid conversation and you just kind of have to get up to speed. Same principle. Having characters address the reader rather than each other, which to me would be the simplest way to think about bad exposition is just not something I'm going to be doing with D versus M. And on a related note, it's why I don't do thought bubbles. You're never going to see a thought bubble in D versus M. 
I'm just not doing that kind of storytelling. Thought bubbles are basically addressing the reader. And they're not meaningfully different from when Deadpool turns to the audience and says something. Whether it's thought bubbles or breaking the fourth wall or even a third person narrator, it's all sort of in the same family. It's all, I'm trying to think about how I want to say this. It's all acknowledging the presence of the reader. And therefore subconsciously or kind of by implication including the reader in the story you're making the reader in a way present for the story there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that unless you're trying to achieve a different response with the reader and i am you're not in d versus m d versus m is playing out in front of you now that might seem like a really fine and kind of academic distinction, but I see it as extremely important. Picture a car going way too fast down a windy cliffside road. It's the difference between are you the driver in this car or are you in the back seat? There are totally different feels and totally different experiences with either of those positions. So therefore, if you're telling a story and you're trying to decide how much direct involvement do you want from the reader how often do you want to address the reader overtly or subtly really depends on what kind of reaction you're going for from your reader do you want them to be in the front seat of the car or the back seat and that doesn't even get into the idea that if you're involving the reader with things like thought bubbles and breaking the fourth wall and third person narration, you're involving the reader, but you're also reminding them that this is a story. And maybe you don't want to do that, especially if you're concerned about suspension of disbelief, especially if you're writing a story about alien invasions and dinosaurs and ray guns and all that. Obviously, this is a big topic, and it might be something I'll just do a whole video about on some later date. But anyway, back to two men in a car. This is a kind of tropey dynamic, two guys in a car, two cops in a car. We've seen it lots of times before. There are cliches associated with that that I wanted to avoid. One was the idea of we're going to have one being the grizzled, cranky, uh, tired old vet, and the other being the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, very naive newbie. I didn't want to do that. That's pretty played out. The other cliche I wanted to avoid was these two are like oil and water. They're very different and therefore they kind of hate each other and fight the whole time. I didn't want to do that either. On the first thing, yes, Reuben and George are very different, but I didn't want their differences to have anything to do with their competence. Reuben's not as experienced a man in black as George, but he's completely effective. Likewise, George, yes, he's much older than Reuben, he could be his father, but he's not this guy who's just itching to retire and is totally worn out and doesn't give a crap about his job anymore. I'm not doing either one of those things. On the idea of them not getting along, to me that's just not only kind of played out and hacky, I think it's not very realistic. I mean, these guys are adults, they're professionals, they're partners, they gotta make it work. Days are long if you don't get along with the person you work with. And they're not going to do that. They have to sit in a car all day with this guy. They got to talk to this guy. They got to work cases together. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Yes, they have totally different lives and experiences and positions and beliefs, but they're both decent people with honest positions that come from rational places. And they know that about each other. So sometimes they may say their piece, disagree, and then they decide where to have lunch as most of us can relate to, unless you just live in an internet comment section. But to get even deeper into the realism, when you think about what this job would entail in the real world, this is a job where moral relativism and cynical pragmatism would almost be prerequisites. I, I don't know how you would do this job without those things. 
This is a job where you have to embrace dishonesty. You have to get comfortable with violating individual rights in the name of the greater good on a near daily basis. You have to maintain a sort of paternalistic authoritarian attitude about what the public does and doesn't need to know about reality. Only certain kinds of people could do that job well and for any length of time, and in fact would be hired. And those aren't the sort that are gonna just go to the mat every time there's a minor disagreement on anything. Okay, so we've talked about Men in Black and D versus M. Let's start talking about Ruben Garcia specifically. Who is he? What is Ruben like? Well, Ruben was born in 1949 in southern Arizona, a little town called Douglas. It's right on the Mexican border. It was, it's small now. It would have been really small when he was there. Uh, not a lot to it. There's something of a downtown, but it's mostly just little houses and shops and a lot of desert. There's a copper mining plant there, I believe. Uh, I don't know if it still works today, but it definitely was back in the day. He grew up in a large family. Uh, lots of people in the house, even more people on special occasions. The whole family went to church on Sundays. As you can see in D vs. M 1975, Ruben's a big guy, and he was a big kid. Uh, as a teen, he worked at a hardware store, mostly moving heavy things from here to there. He played some football in high school. Overall, his early life was sort of quaint and maybe even a little idyllic. But it wasn't to Ruben. For whatever reason, whether his disposition or the specific way he experienced things or maybe his difficult relationship with his dad, he really yearned for big city life. And his dreams of having a nice car and nice clothes and wearing a suit to work and seeing skyscrapers and having an important job gradually metastasized into feeling embarrassed by the poverty he lived in and around and resentful of what he perceived as the failings of almost everyone around him, especially his father. In his view, not only would nobody choose to be living the life that they were all living, nobody was choosing to get out, and it was making his head explode. So in the mid to late 60s, Vietnam started really getting going, and it was right when he's getting old enough to go. And he saw that as an opportunity, not only to become a man, not only to be a hero, not only to see the world, and you know, all the other reasons that a lot of men join the military. But most of all, he saw it as an opportunity to get out of Douglas. So he didn't even wait to get drafted. He enlisted in the army when he was 17 and he's never looked back. Reuben wanted to be the best of the best and signed up for special ops and he became a Green Beret. He did become a real war hero. He did two tours and was thinking of doing a third when his mom wrote him saying his dad was sick. So he did not re-enlist. But by the time he actually got stateside, uh, his dad had already died. And rather than go home, which he now felt funny about he was worried he might get sort of sucked in there and he didn't see much point in going back now that since you know his his dad had died he never did he settled in phoenix instead big city in arizona and set about trying to become an fbi agent or enter the secret service and that's what made him pop up on the radar of the men in black that's how in d versus m the men in black find new recruits. Obviously, you can't apply to be a man in black because nobody knows the men in black exist. They find you and they come and invite you, which is a little bit how I understood uh, the CIA to work back in the day. I don't think they still work like that, but I thought the CIA approached people. And that's where he's been ever since. So when we meet him in D vs. M 1975, he's about 26 years old. Uh, he's never been home since he left for Vietnam when he was 17. And that's kind of a sore spot. It's a little radioactive for him. And I have to believe that when George and Ruben are driving to where they're going in 75, and he's just looking out the window and seeing desert and little houses and small town stuff, very much like where he grew up, of course it's 
churning up all that stuff in his head. He's thinking about it. He's remembering things and he's kind of chewing on just home and family and all the emotionally charged junk that he has around that. So in the early drafts of D versus M 1975, Rubin's attitudes about small towns and the people who live in them were more hostile and more overt. He made it very clear that small town, in his opinion, small towns were filled with ignorant, dirty nobodies and these people are not the same as you and I. Like it was a very much like he felt a distinct class difference between people like him and George and basically like city folk and then small town folk. On the other end of the spectrum, George had kind of an, an equally extreme and caricaturish view of small town life. He saw the people that they were going out to interact with as kind of salt of the earth, hardworking, earnest and honest, God-fearing Americans, like the lifeblood, the backbone of the country, like all that, that whole rap. And that was going to be a minor dust up between George and Reuben on the drive. George was going to express some sort of Mayberry-ish, wistful feelings about small town life. And Reuben was going to call bullshit as he saw it he's like you you know you don't understand you don't know these people i grew up with these people they are not to be admired they are not to be envied and it would have been a little bit of a you know obviously all that ended up on the cutting room floor for a few reasons one of the reasons is i felt like i needed something more casual and small talky and an argument isn't very casual and small talky and light uh, I also when you get into like a whole class debate it seems political it might seem like oh is D versus M going to be some sort of class commentary thing like I, I didn't want to mislead or misdirect the reader in that way I, I mean especially if this is the opening or very nearly the opening conversation in your comic I thought it, it just sucks up too much oxygen and it, and it distracts and it, it will ultimately confuse the reader. That's not where I'm taking them. And it will almost be like a decoy. And I don't want to do that to them. But finally, and most importantly, I, I cut it because it wasn't quite right for where I needed George and Reuben to be in that point in the arcs of their lives at that point in the story of D versus M. And to me, it's just an example of how at some point, you know, you shape a character and you refine them and you flesh them out and you really try to come up with every little detail like I do, like, oh, Reuben played football in high school. <laughs> you know, is that really going to be relevant in the comic? No, but you, you come up with this very fully realized, sketched out version of this human being. But ultimately, the time comes when you have to take them and plug them into your story and make them fit in neatly in a way where they're going to do exactly what you need them to do with the idea of the story you had in mind. And sometimes whatever you came up with, whatever little sculpture you made, it doesn't quite fit and you need to round some edges. And that was a thing where it's like, you know, Reuben being just very hostile about small town life doesn't quite work. And George being like, you know, Mayberry forever doesn't quite work. And it, in what I, the story I'm trying to tell. Now, I do think Reuben was probably a lot like that before he went to Vietnam. But I think some of the stuff he saw in Vietnam watered those attitudes down a little bit, softened them a little bit. And I think ever since then, spending a lot of his work, his man in black work in small towns, 
have softened and watered down those thoughts. And I think feeling some, whether it might be difficult for him to admit, a lot of regret about how he's related to his family has softened and watered down those thoughts. I don't think he's quite the edgelord about it as he might have been before Vietnam and how he was in some of the early drafts of 75. So what is Rubin's 1975 life like outside of his work? I think pretty normal for like just a, a bachelor in the mid 70s. He dates, he, he, when he's talking about the movie that he saw uh, in the beginning of the comic, which is uh, Three Days of the Condor, by the way, which is totally worth watching, it's very cool. He saw that the night before on a date. As mentioned, he's a little estranged, well, a lot estranged from his family, uh, but there is still some contact there. I think he uh, exchanges letters with his mom and his favorite sister. So there's a little bit of contact there. I think his apartment is a soldier's apartment. I think it is very sparsely decorated, uh, spartanly decorated. Uh, it is spotless. I think you could eat off of his bathroom floor. I think he also kind of uh, puts himself together like a soldier. I think he is always cleanly shaven. I think he shaves with a straight edge. I think he, his hair is always perfect and tight and closely cropped and pomaded all into control. I think he is in uh, always a perfectly ironed and crisp white shirt. I think his shoes are shined. I think he takes time to polish his wristwatch. I think he smells of aqua velva and Old Spice. You know what I mean? He's just, he's that guy. You know who I mean? You've met this guy. You, I mean, you probably have this guy in your family. Maybe he's like an uncle or a grandpa or a dad or something. He's definitely a boomer, but he's that type where there's, there's always a way to do things. There's an order of operations. Everything is just right. Everything is clean and orderly and just so. So in D versus M 1975, Reuben gets hit by befuddler gas. Uh, in what is probably the, the big dramatic sequence in the comic. And he experiences all sorts of strange hallucinations. And people have asked me, are those just, just random crazy images that I came up with, or do they mean something? They absolutely mean something. Every hallucination you'll ever, you've ever seen in D vs. M, or will ever see in future D vs. M's, is very carefully considered. Um, for a little bit of Befuddler Gas 101, how it basically works is it somehow uh, activates the most significant and emotionally charged memories that are buried in your brain, stirs them up and represents them to you in a extremely convincing visual hallucination but kind of a fever dreamy version of whatever it was. So it's in kind of what makes it the most horrible way exactly tuned for you. The experience will be completely custom. <laughs> It'll be a bespoke nightmare. Uh, some of the memories and the things that get churned up might not be inherently bad. It's just the weirdness of it that's bad. So, I mean, just making up significant memories. These aren't my own. I'm just like, if I had to come up with a new character, it's like maybe uh, someone gets hit by the gas and they see a strange version of their favorite childhood toy. And then they see that dog they saw get hit by a car once right in front of them. And then they see uh, their grandmother's dentures floating in a glass. And then they see, you know, the first time they saw a real dead body in an open casket funeral. Whatever these big, meaningful, strange things they've seen in their life, all of those get churned up into this weird tornado of 
funhouse mirror images and shown to them in a way that's very hard to reject or disbelieve, even if you know it's fake, even if you know it's hallucin a hallucination. You just can't resist it for too long. And again, the personal nature of it makes it completely debilitating uh, and can and does, as we see with the man in the house in D versus M 1975, cause violent psychotic breaks. Uh, some people will just end up being sort of crumbled into a pool, <laughs> you know, just comatose and quivering. But some people will absolutely excuse the term if it's insensitive, go crazy. Like they will absolutely lose their mind and become violent and dangerous and a threat, which just as a little hint of things to come in D versus M is sort of the alien's purpose in using it. It's to incapacitate threats, but also create new threats on the battlefield against, it's sort of a, a fratricide thing, a friendly fire situation. You're now mixing up the chessboard a little bit. You're turning pawns from white to black, and that's kind of how they use it. You'll see more of that in the future. So with that all in mind, it's it's worth pointing out that Ruben barely survived that experience, just barely. And if it had gone any longer, he would have been doomed for sure. The only reason he managed to somehow navigate it was his training and the fact that he had Blake to lean on as a sort of reality anchor to constantly remind him of what was real and then by implication, what was not. But even then, it started to go south, and he was just a hair away from murdering Blake. You know, I mean, that it really was close to going over a cliff. And when you read D versus M 1975, we're talking about all of that happening in the span of maybe 90 seconds, maybe two minutes. Like, it was very close. And at that 90 second or two minute mark, it was about to become a very, very dark ending to this story. And in fact, there were early drafts of 75 where that's exactly how it went. I had a few versions where Ruben doesn't hold it together. Um, it's D versus them, man. As I mentioned in the intro, Ruben is the first D vs. M character to appear in more than one story. We see him briefly in D vs. M 1997. Uh, he's older, obviously, and heavier and starting to gray. His hairline's a little bit higher up. And it appears he's moved up in the world, which you'd hope after being in the same career for 22 years. He seems to be sort of moving into the role George had in 1975, which is the seasoned old pro man in black. But there's a hint the job hasn't fully soaked into his bones. There's a hint he hasn't lost his awareness of the moral complexity of his work. Circling all the way back to the beginning with the goal of making a plausible man in black. I think showing that complexity helps sell it. Now, I'm not naive. There are uncomplicated, unconflicted people in the world, and not every bad person or person in a morally gray role has self-awareness or hand rings over the rightness and wrongness of things. Most probably don't, but Ruben does. And I think that makes him engaging. It helps make him engaging. He's trying to figure out the best way to swim in pretty muddy water. And while an argument could be made, he's sort of on the villain side of the equation. It's worth at least acknowledging the tragedy of Ruben and anyone else in his role. These people who are constantly seeing and experiencing paradigm exploding things that change the way they understand not just people but the universe and reality and they just have to sort of swallow it 
George isn't wrong when he tells him it's a heavy burden they carry. And we meet Reuben at a time in his life when he's just beginning to feel that weight. It's just sinking in what this job costs him personally and spiritually. A buddy of mine and a great creator, Jim Lujan, told me that Reuben was his favorite character but that he was also a little afraid to tell me that because he was sure this being D versus M, Ruben was in for some terrible fate. And I kind of loved that, uh, partly because one of my ambitions with D versus M was to create a tone and a feel that made readers think anything could happen but especially bad things could happen. As for his concern, you know, I want to be clear. I'm spending a lot of time on Ruben. I'm talking about Ruben a lot. And Ruben did appear in more than one book. That being said, D vs. M is an anthology. And my vision for D vs. M is each comic focuses on a different POV character and their specific story in the whole of this universe. So... D versus M is, of course, not about Reuben. That being said, Reuben's character and his struggles and his arc are very relevant to some of the bigger themes I'm exploring in D versus M and that I hope to kind of bring, wrap this all up into. So while D vs. M isn't about Reuben, you probably will see Reuben again. And as for whether Jim is right to worry about what could happen to Reuben in the future, you'll see.